like the pharaohs who built the pyramids, Ithra will be the pyramid of Saudi Arabia. للتعبير عن وطننا وثقافتنا وإبداعاتنا بعقول سعودية وقدرات محلية وتعاون عالم. We explore and we tell stories about what we find when we explore. Those to me are the two things that human beings do. على هالمركز انه ان شاء الله سيثري الجو الثقافي في المملكه العربيه السعوديه. ان نستمع الى غيرنا وان نستفيد منهم وان نخطط نحن لانفسنا. اعتقد هذا هو الطريق السليم. is an expression of faith and um, I feel that it, this is an eternal message it's not something that's for the moment التحولات الاقتصاديه والاجتماعيه اذا لم يسندها ويؤسس لها نهضه ثقافيه فنيه قد تصيب الانسان بالقلق وممكن ان تهز من كثير من وجوده الواقع والحياتي. I can see how Ithra can be a game changer for Saudi artists but also the broader public to realize potential. سعادة مقترنة بالتطوع ولعل التطوع وسيلة هامة جدا جدا في حياة كل واحد منا إلى تعظيم الأثر الخاص به Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rasha Rawaf, and welcome to Ithra Talks. I'm live with you today from the Great Hall of the King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture, commonly known as Ithra, here in Dhahran, Saudi Arabia. Ithra Talks is a weekly series with creative leaders from around the world. This is part of Ithra's commitment to offer a platform for sharing knowledge, connecting passions, and exchanging ideas, where we connect our audiences with subject matter experts from all over the world on a variety of topics. Today, we'll be scaling the world of architecture with our guests, Shatel Torsen, live from Oslo, and Fatma Rashid of Ithra, here with me in Bahrain. Please participate in the discussion by posting your questions on this YouTube live session or through the hashtag Ithra Talks on Twitter. Kajil Thorsen is founding member is a founding partner of Snohetta, a Norwegian architecture firm that has designed major projects around the world, including the Biblioteca Alexandria in Egypt and the Oslo Opera House, both winners of the World Architecture Award. Snohetta also designed Ithra, which opened in 2018, and is in the same year was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Greatest Places in the World to Visit. We are also joined by Saudi interior architect Fatma Rashid, who had a leading role in the design and construction of Ithra, who has been working closely with Chatel from the moment Snoheta won the competition to design Ithra until the opening day. She is recognized as the founder of key creative initiatives in the kingdom, such as the Dhahran Fab Lab and the first creativity forum in Saudi Arabia. Chatel and Fatma, Welcome to Ithra Talks. Uh, thank you, Russia. It's a pleasure to be contributing to this discussion with Shatil, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of our viewers who are watching us now. It's really nice Between to be here, and um, thank you so much. Between the both two of you, you have over half a century of experience in the field. Let's start off with your definition of architecture from your perspective. Why don't we start with you, Shatel? Well, thank you very much. I mean, um, 
first and foremost, uh, the way we have perceived things throughout the years is that architecture slowly generates a certain situation where you have to be quite clear about your position. So it is first and foremost for people and for the environment. Very seldom can you claim that architecture is for the sake of architecture. Very seldom can you claim that if it doesn't move something forward, it becomes, if it doesn't encourage change, it becomes ignorant. And I think one of the most important things when we talk about definition of architecture is that it has its own recognition as a profession. And that's why it's not art. Art is beautiful and you can have an artistic uh, uh, direction in your architecture, but architecture is architecture, art is art. And I think to a large extent that architecture in its own setting is starting to become a very, very important driver. Um, it's interesting, this question is very interesting because every, uh, every time you try to answer this question, it really um, comes from your perception of what architecture means. Uh, when we started uh, studying architecture or the field of design, uh, our definition of it was the absolute definition of uh, creating beautiful shelters uh, that are attractive, that enhance the, uh, the landscape of the city. Uh, but as you move forward in this, uh, in this field and in this career with, with all of the experiences you accumulate, you come to a realization that is associated also with the responsibility. The realization of this science which is really the collective of so many sciences, uh, uh, whether be it in the anthropologist side or the, uh, uh, or the technology or the, the science of science and engineering and the science of art. Uh, and then becomes a responsibility of realizing that every product you create is really uh, consuming some of the resources that we have on this planet. Later on, you come to your own definition uh, of architecture. And from my own perspective, realizing the impact of architecture on human lives, I came to my own definition of architecture, architecture as being the art of curating human uh, memorable experiences. Thank you, Fatma. Can you guys tell me how can architecture be used to shape societies and communities? How do we use architecture for that? Maybe I should comment on Fatma's uh, definition first. Uh, it's the first sure. time I hear this definition, Fatma, but it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's great. And, uh, and the aspect of curating these things, putting them together, there is a huge complexity in architecture where so many issues have to come together uh, in, in one. And at the end, it has to be at the service of people and the environment. So in the end, I love your definition. When it comes to societies and communities, can architecture have an impact? Of course, it can have an impact. I mean, it is a tool. It is a stage for future happenings. It is a way of generating certain activities uh, within these architecture. It's spatial, it's time, uh, there are timelines connected to it. It has a, a deep impact on us as uh, thinking humans. I mean, we are spending in the Western world and in the modern world, approximately 90% of our lives indoor. Out of these, about 14% in the toilet, I should, you know. It's, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing indoor experience that we are concerned with every day. And that means that every time we move into a room, every time we sit around the table, every time we sit on a chair, we are being influenced by these surroundings. We have to take a stance, we have to take a chance, we have to take a, a, a stand in relationship to how we think about these surroundings and how we communicate with others. It's very difficult to negotiate peace in a, a international hotel lobby. Simply because the space is sometimes too generic. We need to design spaces that have very specific tasks in the way they are developing. Like the hall you're sitting in now is for big community events and for big exhibition events. It could not look like a library. It is an exhibition hall. 
And that means that architecture is combining all of these, and we'll get back to that, I hope. But Ithra is this beautiful combination of so many functions, which puts the complexity of Ithra even one step further. But of course, it influences societies through individuals, through learning, and especially for Ithra also, maybe the relationship to educating young people. You know, it's all about the next generation and, and how we actually sensitize this generation in the future. Um, architecture or built environment is becoming very important now because uh, it is becoming the testimonial of our heritage. And I'm not talking about heritage necessarily in the past, uh, but I'm talking about the heritage that we will pass to our uh, future generation. Uh, it's sort of documenting the story of uh, human achievements. Uh, human accomplishments. Uh, when we consider this role, then we, we realize that the built environment and the architecture really plays a role in the social change because number one, it documents what was the starting point or how it was before and then you can track it and see where it's going. Uh, number two, it influences the experiences and the behavior that we are having in our present time and it's creating an experimental uh, platform for all of the science and the technology that we are uh, embedding uh, in, uh, in this uh, built environment. Uh, but most of all, architecture is becoming more and more a tool uh, to influence a certain uh, behavior to instill certain values that need to pass by and to aspire different outcome of uh, human interaction. We are witnessing this more and more, realizing the, the impact of it more and more. And there, this is why maybe the, the shape and the landscape of the built environment now in this century is really changing in, in a very interesting way. And taking these experiences, we don't, it's not just the experiences of people and how they use these spaces, but it's also the senses themselves. So uh, we can orient ourselves with our eyes when we come into a building. Uh, there are other senses that we use in our body uh, to experience the building. How do you take, uh, or how do you use the term experiential in your consideration and use the senses in designing uh, the, the design process? of buildings? Well, maybe um, uh, to, to go for that uh, very quickly, uh, there is a certain level of experiential representations that need to be at hand if you're going to move forward. So the experience of a place is all depending on your body location in relationship to that situation. That means that when you come uh, to somewhere, uh, that particular place starts influencing you depending on where you have your eyes, where you have your ears, where you have your mouth, where you have your nose. And all of a sudden, these total understanding of senses start giving an impression and a feedback to your brain, feedback to your body that tells you where you are. So experiential is also a reference system to where you are in the world and how you, how you see your surroundings. And that's why Lately, for the last few years, we've started looking at architecture as the arts of prepositions, meaning in front of, behind, over, under, and depending on where you have your body, these situations and the experience you have of that particular element will change, including all the other senses. So when we start designing these elements of buildings, spatial uh, sequences entering in and out, uh, coming from one space to another. All of these are transition zones where you change your body location and your body location describes where you are in the world and it describes your relationship to your surroundings. I think architecture as the art of prepositions is an interesting proposal to me simply because it puts the human body, the human brain, the human condition at the forefront of what architecture is doing and by that, it's helping you, as Fatma also said, a tool. It's helping you as a tool to recognize what you are, where you are, and why you are there. Uh, if I may comment also on that or elaborate on that, um, 
a part of the um, of these five senses and the experiential uh, element there is also the uh, uh, the relationship to the other uh, people the other occupiers on this space uh, how do you interface with them or how do you want to curate if i may say the experience of interfacing or collaboration or communication or appreciation uh, all of these uh, behaviors they are contributing into how we are shaping the uh, the spaces and how we are shaping these experiences that that are in my opinion that are surrounded by built environments so it's it's mm. capturing the uh, the human uh, behavior and what is aspired also to be a behavior or an attitude and mm. putting it in the proper surrounding that will facilitate for this to be uh, happening organically. Yeah, and maybe it maybe it puts us. Sorry, I, I just have to comment no, on this. Ahead. It's really yes, an interesting course, discussion please. because it bring it brings us back to uh, the basic principles of psychology. You could say the ABC, you know, uh, uh, of uh, psychology, which is uh, uh, behavior, uh, cognition, and and uh, uh, the actual understanding of where you are. So in a way, you are at the attention of things together with others or in a singular in the plural manner so you are still individual in the space even though you're together with others but you are contributing Absolutely. to the collectiveness by being there and that's at the essence of being together with others and that's how communities are being described so affect behavior and cognition are the three most important things that actually bring us into architecture and why architecture has become the way it has since we moved out of the caves. <laughs> uh, Chatel, Snowhead is a leading multidisciplinary creative firm that focuses on architecture and beyond. Can you take us through the design methodology of Snowhead? Yes, it's been a, a long evolving uh, kind of story, of course, when it comes to how, how can you best be creative? Uh, many years ago, we started um, a PhD program together with some scientists trying to find out what Snowhead was doing when, when we were at our best. Uh, the outcome of that was a study called IdeaWorks, which has a series of drivers. Uh, like, for instance, liberating laughter is a driver, or craving wonder is a driver, or uh, uh, rapid prototyping could be a driver. And all of these we started looking into. Um, as elements of a possible creative workshop methodology. So then we um, created a workshop which is very systematically together with the research institute in Trondheim in Norway, uh, where everyone involved goes through certain stages um, of this creative workshop, systemized, as I say. Uh, and by that, we're getting into a position where we're trying to boil down high complexities into what we call simplexity. That means you don't lose the complexity of a situation, but the wording that you're using for a possible project in a creative sense is boiled down to maybe one word or one sentence. Uh, so this workshop includes usually 20 to 25 people. It can go in all kinds of directions um, when it comes to who's invited. It's a widespread uh, gallery of different people, starting with authors, uh, scientists, uh, architects, landscape architects, uh, designers, engineers. And these people come together by in invitation, obviously, but also to follow that program in IdeaWorks. Uh, and one of the very essential elements of IdeaWorks is zooming out, where you start trying to get a picture of the things you're dealing with. You also use in uh, Snohetta um, a term called transpositioning, which I understand means bringing the experts from different fields to come together and step out of their comfort zone to give input on different areas of a project as a way of breaking perceptions. Can you tell me more about this approach and why is it important to Snohetta? The um, term transposition actually comes out of medicine. Uh, we can look it up later and discuss that. But what it really means in our uh, way of working creatively is that we want 
people to leave their comfort zones uh, as professionals. We are really totally interested in the musician in an engineer. We are interested in getting people out of their preconceptions of what they have done before and try to put them into a different situation where they become a full person so that we can actually trigger maybe hobbies or interests in that particular person to come to the table in, in the creative work. Of course, when we start production, we all go back to our specializations and professions, but especially in creative work, it is extremely important to generate situations of an open mind. And in order to be able to deal with these open mind situations, we have to relax people from their basic responsibilities. So the engineer cannot be held liable for something he says in this meeting two years down the road, simply because he's an engineer. He was there as a person, not as an engineer. And this transpositioning then means we can shift professions between one another. It's kind of a role game. And by doing that, we've found in so many cases already that the results coming out of these creative workshops are totally amazing. They bring completely new aspects and innovation into creativity. And Fatma, you use transpositioning as well in your creative process here at Ithra uh, with the pr projects that we talked about earlier, mentioning, for example, the Creativity Forum. Can you tell us about the value added from, from this uh, applying this process in your own experience? Mm -hmm. uh, we have actually um, used that approach and we, we called it at that time, uh, at one element, we called it the interdisciplinary approach. Uh, this is when we were trying to curate uh, or actually to create something uh, creative, the product itself, whether it being the architecture or the design or the, uh, the art programs. And uh, with that, we have involved different disciplinaries. Uh, we have invited, for example, a dentist to have a dialogue and participate in a project, uh, in this project, uh, with, with the artist with the graphic designers, with the IT engineers, uh, where we believe that the collective creativity would be something that, that would be iconic. And that would be, uh, uh, that will create something that will survive. Uh, but another uh, way that we used or we adapted that approach is when we were thinking of our, uh, of the visitors, the consumers, the end users, uh, of this space and what is the aspired outcome, uh, what is the aspired emotions that uh, we wish to create. And this is where we try to sometimes wear the hat of a child or wear a hat of an, a persona of uh, an end user who is uh, shy and timid. However, we want, to, uh, we want him or her to enjoy their uh, utilization of this space, and we want him to be engaged with, with others. Uh, wearing these different hats uh, and thinking of the individual in one way, and then thinking of the collective uh, audience or public users, uh, how would they be in, uh, benefiting really? Uh, of these spaces helped us in shaping a lot of the experiences, not only in the spaces, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the building itself, but also uh, in the programs. Uh, and we have, um, we have discovered that with this approach, we made sure that the, uh, the target audience or the mass of the public who come to consume these experiences or come to visit uh, these places become very engaged and feel an ownership uh, of the place that they are visiting because it was really talking to each individual uh, and uh, each one of them. Thank you Fatma. I'll go back to you Chatel. Um, Snohata, 
it's not your typical design firm. I mean, aside from your award-winning buildings and designs, you've also gotten yourself into pro conceptual projects, uh, such as uh, designing the conceptual project on Mars and uh, designing the Norwegian currency. Can you tell me about your process of why and how do you get into these kinds of projects? Well, um, I guess it all starts with interest and passion about uh, our surroundings, per se. Uh, everything that is physical, which influences how we think, what we do, is probably of great interest to us as a community and as a design and architectural community here at Snurdal. So it's the holistic approach to everything that surrounds us that has interest of us. So how does design thinking graphic design thinking actually influence architecture or how does architecture as a profession influence furniture design when you start thinking about shape and form. So maybe one of the best uh, examples for the moment is our underwater restaurant where every piece of that project is designed by us from the chairs to the views uh, to how the things actually evolve uh, when it comes to any type of material, including the web page and how it's being perceived by the public and how you how you uh, do the logo, how you actually look at uh, the way you serve things. And we are interested in the holistic perspective of things and not uh, uh, the hollow, maybe cylindrical thinking. And I think it's also reflected in, in what we were saying about transpositioning, where Fatma is, is straight to the point, but it's all to do with the holistic elements of how we think and everything influences each other. There is, everything is connected to everything, basically. Uh, Shatil, I have a question for you. I remember once you told me about your smallest project that you worked on. Can you tell us this story? Talk about this project well, uh, there, a little. Yeah, there are so few. There, uh, since then, we've made even smaller projects, but. But uh, the very first, very smallest project for us was was uh, uh, the fountain for a cat. And I'm not sure whether you've seen a picture. I, you remember the picture? I think this kind yeah. of notion between the cat and, and that little fountain started becoming such an essential way of driving something forward. So all of a sudden, the cat owned the fountain because it was designed for the cat. So believe it or not, the habit of the cat started getting connected to the design of that little water uh, element and its behavior started being becoming repetitive so in the end that cat owned that little fountain uh, so that only shows that very small projects can be of huge importance not necessarily to big crowds of people but even to smaller crowds of people and i believe again that the effect of architecture is not necessarily measured by size it's measured by the quality that it provides to people uh, what i personally like about this project truly uh, if i may comment on this is how this behavior which became kind of a routine for the cat to go to the fountain and have its uh, satisfy its thirst uh, at the same time it became a moment a memorable moment for the viewers or the uh, the people who actually live around uh, in the neighborhood and uh, watch this uh, behavior and what kind of conversation and memories and reflections that they m might have because of this moment. And, and this is really what it intrigues me about architecture when you're really creating those insightful and very deep moments in the human memory that they are sharing together at one specific moment of time. I, I just wanted to share that with you because I, no, I thought it's, it's really, it's, uh, as you said, it's, it's not the size of the project as much as uh, what is the, uh, the impact of it. Now we're going deep and beautiful here. Wonderful. Yes. Okay, so we've got these exciting projects now. So from the, the fountain for the cat to the project on Mars. And I remember in a previous interview, Chatel, you mentioned that sometimes you find yourself with over 60 projects on your desk, on your design desk. So can you walk us through the process uh, of how do you select which projects to execute, to work on? Well, we have a 
double-sided process um, here. Uh, of course, the office as such, the practice, uh, the way we are distributed around the world for the moment, make a quite an autonomous uh, approach to what kind of projects they will want to do in their own markets around the world, starting in Paris, Innsbruck in Austria, Adelaide in, uh, in Australia, New York, uh, San Francisco, uh, Oslo, uh, Hong Kong. So all these places have kind of different attitudes to how they choose and what they are looking at in the local markets. At the same time, there is a, an overriding, let's say, value content that we're trying to defend uh, throughout the choices of projects that we're making. It very much boils down to maybe the ambitions of a client, very much whether it can be in service of society. Today, we are really quite concerned about the ambitions when it comes to CO2 and the climate uh, and the environmental issues, but we are still as much involved in the understanding of, of the social sustainability of these buildings and how they evolve in, in that sense. And uh, most likely, it's a combination of all these things that drives us to make choices. Now, it's also no secret that we have believed for a long time that cultural projects can actually uh, drive societies uh, to a large extent forward. And maybe by doing that, also sensitizing the public uh, to actually find things in themselves they did not completely know they had, although they had some sort of feeling that there was something inside here. And then all of a sudden, these projects that we choose to do have the possibility of bringing something out in people uh, they only had a hunch about that they actually had. It's these tiny little aha moments in people's lives where they recognize things in themselves. Well, when you're, when you're designing in these different locations, as you mentioned in Hong Kong and Oslo and Dahran, hopefully you didn't have to go to Mars, but um, how do you uh, take these different landscapes and climates and incorporate them into the design of your, of your faraway places and uh, bring in local context and make the architecture that is fitting for that place? Well, it's a, it's a combined process of a lot of things, uh, how we work with clients, how we work with specialists. But primarily, you could say that the very starting point of, of the solution of a good project is how thorough are you with the upfront research that you're doing? How deep are you going into the history of a place? How deep are you going into the current climatic situations? How precise are you with the, the, the wind, the sun? how things are being moved. So it's all of these kind of issues that are dealing with how you think, where you go, and then the process on the way. So we have the sequence of people, process, projects. So the, the, the road is not the goal. Mm -hmm. The projects are the goal, but the way there needs to be very, very particular and very, very particular in the sense. I've sometimes used the comparison by saying, we are interested in different facts from a place that could maybe trigger a different idea. Let's say you have a very crowded uh, uh, street with a lot of cars on it. Every designer would be interested if he's planning something close to this road to understand how many cars are actually on this road. We would not only be interested in how many cars, we would be interested in how many red cars, how many blue cars, how many yellow cars are there. And out of reading this kind of maybe different facts that initiates and gives us the possibility to incorporate deeper into a context. Not only climatic, again, back to psychology, maybe more emotional connection to that place, because there's no, uh, 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 it's, n it's not like the Ithra, it's a classical uh, Saudi building, but you would, when you see it, probably say, this must be in Saudi. Fatma, you've traveled as well. So you relocated to Oslo and you stayed there for a year and a half for um, the Ithra project. So what, was, uh, what were the differences that you found in working for a Norwegian um, design firm such as Snohetta versus working in previous projects that you've had here in Saudi? Uh, those one year and a half, uh, they were sort of maybe the fastest mental marathon I, I, I experienced in my life. Um, 
I would say the, 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 that experience is different, not only in terms of the geographical location or working with an international office. I think the experience was also different uh, from all of my previous experiences and projects in Saudi Arabia uh, because of the, the type of the project uh, that we were working on, because of the aspiration and the impact that was, um, uh, that was uh, anticipated uh, as a vision of what Ithra wants to achieve. Uh, the, what's, what's the main difference is the continuous dialogues and debates that we had throughout the, the design process. So there was, through this one year and a half, there was not one point of time where we thought enough of conceptualization. Let's go now and finalize things. And, and I think this dialogue had to, con to, to take its time. Uh, it had to grow and uh, be, uh, to expand. Uh, another thing that was very interesting that when I was working uh, in Oslo with this Nuhitta uh, team, uh, the team there was composed of almost 100 uh, designers, uh, uh, so 100 mm. designers with almost uh, 20 different nationalities uh, with different disciplines and trying to work together to curate one seamless a project and experience with one, one unified vision. And that was interesting because the, there should be a tolerance for continuous uh, conversation. There was no one predefined answer to any challenge. There was always an appetite to experiment, to do something different and to come up with different solutions that we collectively will be proud of as introducing this uh, new creature to the world of the built environment, if I may say. Uh, another thing was interesting is uh, the different backgrounds that we had. So I came from a background where the, the behavior of the community is different. Our starting point for cultural experiences is different. Uh, our definition of what appealing beauty or aesthetic that needs to be associated with the built uh, with the building uh, is different. Uh, so it was very important that we share these aspirations. We understand the differences till we reach something mutual. So the uh, international team would bring a lot of a global insight. However, the impact that we wanted to create it, to create. Uh, was really uh, relying on our understanding the behavior of our community. So having these conversations, uh, talking about the, um, the social behavior, the, uh, the way uh, people interact in our community versus in different communities, uh, what would be uh, a cultural experiences, uh, what would be a cultural experience look like? Uh, Ithra has the first theater uh, in Saudi Arabia. It has the first public cinema. We, 10 years ago, we were thinking, how would the theater experience be in Saudi Arabia? So talking about that uh, was very important, uh, trying to push the boundaries. Uh, this project is unique because from the design process, we try to push so many boundaries, whether be it in the, uh, the impact of the project, the engineering, uh, I would say the engineering exploration and innovations, the, uh, the architectural language, uh, having this conversation with an international team uh, was very interesting. It, it was an experience that on a personal level, I felt it, it enriched me and I felt, uh, um, I felt sort of very, um, sort of very uh, capable of uh, realizing all of those aspirations of this project just through having these conversations and dialogue and discussions. Um, what do you think, uh, Shatil, uh, about those times? Uh, I know that no, it I was think... your first project also uh, in Saudi Arabia. So understanding the, mm. the, uh, the culture in Saudi Arabia was uh, something that very challenging maybe at that time. We're talking about a decade ago. 
<clears throat> yes, uh, no, I, I totally agree, but you know, I think the setting that uh, uh, you decided from Saudi Aramco's side to put the Saudi Aramco team and yourself together with us during this period was in a way putting ourselves in a no escape situation. And I really like these preconditions that are being operated when you're self-forced to focus and concentrate on the things that you need to do when you develop things. That generates uh, communal ownership to the ideas, the conversations, and the content of what you're developing. I believe, truly, that we would not have reached a project like this had it not had the process not been this way. Uh, I think us uh, co-located, for instance, in Oslo at that particular point in time, over one and a half year, was an important driver for at all managing this project. Like I've said before, it's extremely complex when it comes to functions and, and, and community efforts. But at the same time, these focused periods, these focused conversations, uh, not being able to escape the project ever, not late at night, not in the morning, this full engagement between uh, the patron, the, the user clients, the clients, us, the technical staff, engineers, architects, designers, all together, was, became like a lifestyle situation over this period of time. And I believe almost for solving complex things, and I know it sounds a little demanding to especially young architects out there, but in certain situations you have to really go deep together with other people in order to find what you're looking for. And in my mind, that's what we did this one and a half year when you were there in Oslo with us. Uh, yeah. Uh, another thing that I think was very profound in this experience was when you have so many designers, when you have so many creatives uh, working together in one project, uh, as exciting as it might sound, uh, but also it's challenging because each designer, each creative uh, would come with his or her own um, idea. And uh, as creative uh, people, usually they, they, they are sort of uh, territorial, maybe, uh, if I may say, about their ideas. Uh, they, they feel so convinced about them, and the effort would be focused on how to convince the other party to adapt to this, uh, to this creative approach or creative idea. Uh, and I think this, this what was very interesting in the setting that we had was at the end of the day, uh, there was a huge generosity of sharing ideas and willing to contribute to enhancement of one's idea to the point where a lot of the very successful uh, uh, products that we ended up with, you cannot uh, attribute it to one single designer or one single um, architect or uh, individual. And uh, nobody would, would claim that it's his own uh, idea only. And this is the beauty of it because in a field of creativity, uh, really an individual cannot achieve and realize the ultimate success without being generous and allowing opportunities for others to contribute to the build up to this, if I may say, great idea to be even greater and will stand against all challenges, whether in uh, technical challenges or even challenges uh, on time. Uh, I think that, that that would be one of the unique experiences or we, unique settings that we ever had uh, in any project. I like yeah, I how you brought, the, uh, you brought the harmony of the designers and the architects into one space and uh, you have a product coming out of it. But there's also another harmony that we need to discuss. Um, usually designers and architects, they set out to have um, iconic, uh, uh, iconic buildings that are both global and modern, modern. So how can they fulfill this aspiration while being faithful to local traditions of architecture? So how can we harmonize the modern and iconic with the local traditions? Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, this was uh, one of the uh, very early comments that uh, we heard when uh, when the ethra when the ethra design was uh, published like is is this traditional is this 
regional architecture, is, is this Islamic architecture. Um, I personally would like to uh, claim that uh, traditional architecture or heritage architecture or uh, regional architecture is not only with the interpretation of the uh, very basic traditional elements, but it's more about the, uh, the reasons why those elements were created at a given time. Uh, for example, uh, throughout the history we noticed that every element that is embedded or being adopted uh, in architecture was because of a reason whether because of a technical challenge at that time whether because of a climatic conditions of that place whether because of the the functionality of that given uh, space uh, buildings were uh, storytellers of their time uh, we don't I personally don't believe that uh, copying traditional architecture would be uh, um, an, a truthful storyteller of our time. However, we understand that a lot of the traditional elements or the heritage that we have has a, a value, have a value. So the, quest the question was more of what are the values that uh, we want to pass in our current or in our contemporary architecture and our contemporary design that will uh, consider all of the basics uh, but also would be telling uh, will be helping us to create the heritage for the future will be helping us to tell the story our story for a future generation so for example the um, the use of uh, materials, the regional materials that was used in traditional architecture, like the uh, like the rammed earth, this old masonry technique to build walls out of uh, out of uh, sand and mud from uh, the very uh, from the uh, from the same site. Uh, yes, it is a traditional. Uh, however, when we implemented it here, we implemented it to to make sure that. This technique is still valid to be adopted in our contemporary architecture. It is helping uh, and supporting the functionality that we aspire to have. And yet it's not stopping us from experimenting with the new techniques and the new innovations. The, we also uh, adopted the reinterpretation of some visual elements like the Islamic ornamentation. Uh, who says Islamic ornamentation uh, cannot be evolving, cannot be developed, and cannot be uh, re-experienced in a different way. So when, when you take an element like that and you deconstruct it, defragment it, and reapply it in a different material, then you're sort of carrying these traditional uh, valuable elements from your regional architecture, your... Uh, um, your original architecture and passing it to the new generation, opening uh, the gate for more experiential platform. And I believe with this, with this approach, you actually contribute more to um, bringing to life those uh, old concepts uh, in a way that they are not uh, taken as uh, face value. You see now why we work so well together. <laughs> Beautiful. Chatel, do you have anything to add to that from your experience of being global and how you've uh, incorporated local into global? I think uh, it was perfectly put by Fatma. Of course, there, there is always uh, this uh, situation where you look at the attitudes of uh, whatever history has to bring forward. So we very often subdivide our projects into the understanding of a past, uh, the understanding of a present, and a possible understanding of the future, but we always refer it back to the present. So it's more like the past that is experienced now, and how you define it now, and it's the possible future how you define it now, and obviously also the present as such, and how you live it. So these things come together, and I totally agree, I mean, interpretations uh, of possible architectures maybe bring out things that were already at the very begin beginning intended. So sometimes you go further back 
than what is the reference project, historically speaking. Sometimes we go further back in history uh, in order to find the right things. So that the rammed earth, for instance, is thousands of years old as a building technology. And in some uh, situations, it might not be seen as a relevant building technology today, but by doing that today, we actually show that, yes, it is as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago, whereas the stainless steel pipes surrounding the building, which almost move in direction of ornament and uh, jewelry, uh, almost, of course, could not have been done thousands of years ago. So it's this meeting point between contemporary history and uh, the possible future of a program. And when these things come together, it's more of a fulfillment within the society of bringing it forward. And of course, in that sense, also enhancing change. Excellent. All right, so let's move on to sustainability. Uh, sustainability is a key word in all fields and industries these days, and architecture is no exception. How do you incorporate sustainability in your design approach? For the moment, uh, the climate issues are really very, very much uh, a problem, I would say. Uh, and the building industry is for the moment contributing to approximately 40% of CO2 emissions worldwide. Uh, it has changed for the last few years. And as designers and architects, we, we have to take a stand. We have to be really, really focusing on the future CO2 levels that is actually being produced by the buildings and the structures that we create. And by doing that, you have to move into different kinds of strategies. You have to start looking at your own electricity production, renewable uh, construction, uh, renewable energy production. And I know it's, uh, you know it's hard to talk about that in Saudi, and it's hard to talk about it in Norway, because we are all producing countries. But to some extent, slowly, slowly over time, uh, we have to start looking at what is the actual CO2 footprint. We are involved in uh, quite a number of projects. Um, one constellation here in Norway, which is called the Powerhouse Constellation, which is a, a zero emission building uh, with, uh, uh, in its own right, uh, going from cradle to cradle. Um, uh, we are looking at zero emission neighborhoods for the moment where less CO2 efficient buildings can maybe support others that are, uh, 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 can be supported by others that are more CO2 efficient. So. There is a neighborhood strategy for looking at different typologies of buildings uh, consuming more or less energy in that sense. But of course, overriding on top of all of this, you still have social sustainability, right? So sustainability is not limited to environmental sustainability. It also has an aspect of economical sustainability, which means how um, is the money around the world uh, diversified? Uh, how is it operating? How are local communities surviving long term when it comes to economic sustainability? So all these three elements come together in designs. For the last 10, 12 years, of course, since we have been working on social sustainability from what we believe the very inception of Smerta, uh, for the last 10, 12 years, we've added the, the carbon uh, footprint of buildings to our mission. Uh, and uh, lately been completing quite some few buildings which are uh, zero emission buildings. But we are hoping to be able to create um, zero, uh, emission negative buildings in the future, which actually do capture CO2 also straight out of the air or maybe in other ways contribute to a reduction of that. And it should not be confused that when you work with CO2 or environmental issues, not is not necessarily a healthy building. So health, uh, together with uh, climate, together with social sustainability and economic sustainability will probably be the perfect combination uh, which we should be working for uh, in the future. It is complex, it's hard. Architects uh, cannot solve it all, uh, of course. So it needs to be a wide combination between many people pulling in the same direction from all different professions and not at least sharing their knowledge about these items um, in larger groups, making sure that people have available uh, knowledge to be able to move forward. Thank you, Chatel. All right, so let's take another step and move on to current affairs. Uh, the human race has witnessed many events throughout history that have united us globally, for good or for bad. Examples of the good are the World Cup and the discovery of penicillin. 
examples of the bad are world wars and now uh, COVID-19. So I'm wondering about your experiences, both professionally and personally. During the pandemic, how has this affected you? Let's start with you, Chatel. Well, the funny thing is, it's affected us quite differently around the world, you know, uh, and also because the pandemic didn't start at one point uh, or at the same time everywhere around the world. So we've had for the different offices around the world uh, some sort of uh, wave happening at different points in time. Uh, for instance, our Hong Kong office never closed uh, during uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic because uh, Hong Kong is used to these things. Uh, they, they happen every uh, every year and a half, you know. So in a way, they were differently prepared than many other countries. So I find it's it's affected us in different ways. What it has done, though, which is interesting, it has increasingly brought us to into the digital uh, connective uh, and uh, communication world. Of course, uh, we as uh, Snoyat have been working with these kind of video conference systems for quite some time, but now they're becoming more regular. They're becoming more organized. Uh, everyone we're talking to has the same system. We can actually communicate across borders much faster. And it's led to, of course, much less travel, which on one hand is saved, uh, saved some cost, but on the other hand, of course, also um, reduce the CO2 amount that I take as a personal footprint. I would say the things uh, that we have been missing during this period is really to be together with others, to understand, let's say, the, the, the reading between the lines. These, these conferences, as well as they're organized here, have a tendency of having to be really well planned. So there are no, there, there are no circumstances there where the immediate reaction within the split of a second can happen within a much larger group. So I'm, I'm missing out the, the kind of spontaneous aspects of creative work, which is missing completely through, through uh, international communication on the screen. However, I would hope that we can take with us the best that we've learned during this period when it comes to everyday communication on the screen and, and bring back the best of what we had before, namely being together and trying to create things which you can only touch upon when the intensity is high, when people are together in the same room, when you're working over the table, and when spontaneous elements of creativity can happen with, with continuous focus on certain elements. But it hasn't, and I, I have to say, which is great, hasn't influenced us Nohata very much. Uh, fortunately, we have colleagues who've been in a much worse uh, situation, and I have the deepest respect for all those who are struggling in these times. And what about you, Fatma? How has it affected you? Um, in, a, in a personal level, um, there, there, you know, there is always the good and the bad of, of this time. Uh, I would like to hi highlight the, the, the good part, because I think everybody will remember the bad, maybe, or the, the bitter experiences or the, the bitter effect. But I would like to highlight the, uh, the good part, which I, uh, I wish that we will carry on with us uh, later on, which is uh, re to reconnect with yourself, uh, to uh, enjoy the, um, I would say, the, um, enjoy the company of yourself, and uh, feel the, uh, the pace of the day going a little bit slower where you have full control of the 24 hours. So you're not obliged to pre-plan and reschedule every moment because the options are widely open. Uh, you can stay in peace with yourself because you know the things that you can do are a bit limited but then you would pick the, the most valuable one. Uh, this is on a personal level, and I'm, I'm always highlighting this because part of me says and believes that later on when we remember those times, I'm sure there are good things that we will remember. There were some happy moments that we need to capture, and hopefully we need to continue uh, with them. Uh, on a professional level, I think it made us all uh, whether architects or engineers or doctors, I think uh, all of us, uh, it gave us this a moment to reflect uh, 
and revisit our um, our approaches to things, whether in terms of uh, the uh, the speed of uh, the accelerated uh, momentum that we we create in our work environment, uh, whether it's the uh, what we end up producing and adding uh, to this world and to uh, uh, our uh, lives, and the way we are doing things, are we? doing them the right way is there any other way to do them uh, the the introduction of the uh, reliance actually on digital um, tools uh, uh, prove to us that we can do a lot of things even without having to go uh, out of our uh, living space so i think re revisiting everything the need for travel uh, we're reconsidering that uh, do we really need to, to travel as much as we used to do? Uh, does travel become a luxury uh, or unnecessarily? Do we restrict it to necessities? So all of these uh, things that uh, I think uh, we are passing, uh, we're uh, going through our mind, is very important from a professional point of view. Uh, when we go back to normal, uh, to reconsider them, because it's a shame for the old norm to be our future norm. And do you think because our relationships with these buildings, uh, whether it's offices or home, homes, uh, it's changed during this pandemic, do you think that this will impact the future of architecture post-COVID-19? Yes. I mean, um, uh, spatial planning is definitely changing. There is uh, a lot of discussions ongoing when it comes to public space. and. Um, uh, how we actually look at indoor outdoor situations in the future uh, thresholding in different ways and and programs remember when when modernism evolved in in europe it was very much about health and and uh, situations uh, reoccurring in in uh, modern cities or cities in in europe and modernism was there for hygienic reasons to a large extent you know toilets uh, clean water, uh, sunlight into the room and buildings. So I, I believe that within the next few years, we will see a slight design and programming shift in architecture, which also will incorporate very strongly what we have experienced for the last few months. Uh, COVID definitely will have an impact on the future of architecture and uh, in my opinion, uh, I think a few things that we need to consider is uh, what we're going to build uh, and uh, how the buildings will look like, not in terms of, I would say, not in terms of uh, quality on only, but also in terms of quality. Do we really need to introduce more built environment, more buildings to, uh, uh, to our cities where at, at a certain crisis, uh, we noticed that maybe 20% of these buildings were put on hold and on pause. So the question is, what do we need? Do we need to change how we build only, but also, or, or we also need to think how we can creatively repurpose these, the built environment around us uh, to stand to any other challenges or to adapt to our uh, lifestyle. So I, I think this is also part of the uh, ethical uh, uh, practice for uh, builders and architects and even uh, city development, uh, real estate development, to really question, uh, to have this question and wondering, do we need to add more buildings or there is an opportunity to, to repurpose underutilized uh, facilities and buildings? Another thing I think we need to uh, consider is uh, who are going to be our mates in these facilities? We notice the introduction of uh, digital uh, uh, elements and equipments, and uh, and we hear a lot about jobs that are going to be uh, uh, vanished in the future. Does that mean that my roommate, my housemate, my workmate might be uh, uh, not a human being, could be a machine, could be an equipment? So do we still design for people or we design also for people and other maybe man-made creatures, 
that will be accompanying us. I, I know this is a very philosophical approach, but it truly, uh, we need to think of who's going to be the, uh, the population of uh, any new built environment. I love very this idea about uh, develop. I love this idea about uh, uh, developing uh, uh, from a client perspective a new clients and new user groups. But can I maybe just for a second uh, expand a little bit on that? When we did the Opera House in Oslo, it's a hybrid building typically. So there is an opera function under a big public roof. So that building is both an outdoor offering to the public and an indoor offering to the public at the same time. And I believe quite strongly that the hybrid aspects of architecture where density in cities is going to be uh, debated, that buildings that have a hybrid quality are creating a public plaza on the roof or somewhere else in relationship to at the same time as they're creating an indoor function will be necessary because we need to equalize the understanding of density by, by being more hybrid in the way we're thinking about indoor and outdoor. All right, so we're going to move on to a fun segment right now. I'm going to ask you six questions, and I want you to answer them in less than six seconds. So the first question with Chatel, what would you be if you weren't an architect? Archaeologist. Fatma, where would you live if you could go anywhere in the world? I would still live here in Khobar. <laughs> Chatel, what is your favorite architectural landmark, aside of Ithra, of course? Yeah, I understand that. But uh, the Hatshepsut uh, Temple in Aswan, which is one of the incomparable monuments um, of Egyptian times. Fatma, what advice would you give your younger self? Uh, to document uh, every thought that I had since I was able to read and write. Chatel, what is the one thing people wouldn't guess about you? That I've been climbing straight up a very steep mountains. Well, Fatma, if you could go back in time and work on any architectural project you wanted, what project would that be? Uh, I would be working on um, restor restoration of an older district in the city. I still wish to work on, on, to work on such a project. Excellent. All right, so now we'll move on to the Q&A session. In this segment, we'll be joined by Mu'taz al-Mullah, a Saudi architect, to ask you his question live. Hello, Mu'taz. What's your question for Chatel and Fatma? Hello, everyone. Yeah, first of all, I would like to uh, say that I'm glad to be here with you, uh, both Chatel and Fatma. Uh, my question is, uh, between creativity and experience, uh, how do we maintain uh, the, the the level of creativity since the uh, relationship is uh, is inverse relationship between these both uh, uh, terminologies? Hmm. Well, it's a it's a truly interesting question. I have to say, you know, we've been uh, talking for the last uh, 10, 15 years about uh, the meaning of experience and the preconceptions that come with experience. Uh, we've been uh, talking about uh, good experience and bad experience. We've been saying, uh, if you made a mistake, don't do the same mistake again. Now, maybe the, the real thing to do is to do the same mistake because you will never ever be in the same situation in a time frame with the surrounding settings that actually define that mistake. So I find if you're dealing with uh, experience in the right way, it can encourage creativity. At the same time, architecture has this tendency of being this old man's profession, because you have clients only trusting very, very experienced, long time standing portfolios. So how, how do you actually get from this experience based reality and maintain creativity? It's an organizational question. It's how you work, it's how you involve um, your your professional staff at the office. It's how the turnover actually happens within the young people coming in and influencing all of these things. But transpositioning is a method. Transpositioning is a method of putting experience aside when it comes to the creativity processes. So I think you need tools. I think you need methods. 
to break down the prevalence of negative experiences, which very often has dominated the building industry and, and our architecture. We need to get only the positive and good experiences, and that might lead to even more creativity. All right, thank you, Matez, for joining us. We'll now move on to the audience questions received through the YouTube live feed or the Ithra Talks hashtag on Twitter. So the first question that comes to us comes to us from Bender. He says, Hassan Fethi, the well-known Egyptian architect, once said, the Arab house is distinguished by a piece of sky. He was referring to the patio. How does the sky look in an architect's imagination when he, begin, when he or she begins the design? Um, do you want me to start? I mean, first of all, Hassan Fati, of course, what a great architect he was, uh, working with the uh, wind towers and the understanding of, of close relationships between user groups, uh, diving into the deep aspects of, of uh, partially traditional and new definition of Egyptian architecture and um, Arabic architecture. Well, the sky. The sky is different in every place around the world. A wide sky, a framed sky, an understanding of the, the patio framing the sky is one way of looking at how you, with usually with, uh, with the water fountain in the middle, is a way of creating intimacy with the sky above. So intimacy for family or a group of people. But you also have the wide sky, which you have on the ocean or in the desert. So the wide sky is like, is like this huge uh, uh, dome that protects you when you are in there. And all of a sudden, the, the, the sky itself becomes a big protector. The stars, the sun, how these things move. So I think in any type of location, as Hazan Fatih very well understood, you need to look at the sky contextually. Where are you? How fast is the sun coming up? How fast is it going down? How, what is the movement of the sun over the horizon? All of these things relate to the sky, and Hassan Fatih understood that probably better than many others. Um, I think the the um, the relationship with the sky in our uh, uh, in our culture. Uh, is very profound. I'm uh, profound. I mean, uh, the the most famous uh, uh, Arab poetry and literature uh, from centuries ago. Uh, they really were. Uh, they were talking about the sky, the moon, and all all of the elements that they. See. And it was an, an, an inspiring uh, uh, platform for uh, for them. Uh, and I still think that we have this in our. Um, uh, in our uh, DNA, um, and I truly believe that the uh, the latest um, circumstances that we went through with the COVID uh, was a proof of how really our relationship with the external uh, landscape, specifically with the sky, was very important. Whether it being uh, through an uh, open uh, platform like the uh, the courtyards or the gardens, the patios, or through the windows or balconies. Uh, we most often hear about people who were able to survive the lockdown because they had a balcony and balconies usually, or, or uh, patios, or even uh, an, a window wall uh, connects you with this uh, infinite uh, part of the environment. So I, I, th I think it will still continue being with us it's only the implementation of it will be different, maybe through uh, higher windows, higher ceilings. The uh, how do we implement it as a language in the uh, in the built environment is going to be different, but it will always be there. Well, thank you yes. both. All right, the next question comes to us from Mohammed. Mohammed asks, "How would you describe your signature style?" How about we start with you, Fatma? Um, Mohammed, I personally do not believe of um, a signature style uh, in the uh, in the typical definition of uh, signature style. Uh, I believe architecture is more of uh, a theory and approach. I would have a signature in my approach, but not a visual signature um, style. And it's always uh, would be more of being adaptive to the context of uh, what I'm doing, where I'm doing it, and it's to uh, serve uh, uh, to serve which uh, users. Uh, 
so I do, I do not personally believe in a very specific visual signature as much of an approach. And you, Chatel? Well, exactly the same. Uh, you know, it's um, signature is more for us, at least an attitude and, and uh, the value content of why you're doing what you're doing in, in a specific context. So if you were to develop recognizable formal languages, uh, which you define then as a signature, I don't really see why a building should look the same in New York as it should in Dada. I, I really don't get it, even if it's a famous signature uh, behind this particular building. Uh, there is a much different way of looking at these things in the future, I hope, and that is conceptually and contextually at the same time and combining these things in the best possible manner in the future. Well, we've reached the end of our engaging session, but before we conclude, I'd like to give you both the opportunity to share any final thoughts with the audience, especially aspiring architects who are tuning in. Uh, well, this has been a wonderful, you want to start? Yes. No, go ahead, please. No, I think it's it's been this uh, uh, beautiful conversation. I mean, when we started planning this and started talking, you know, you, these things can go in many directions and, and you never know exactly what the message you're bringing forward, how that will impact the viewers. I can only hope that for aspiring architects and designers that they understand that there is a certain deep end engagement relevant for developing a trust in oneself to continue uh, designing things that might lead to change. For me, really, the, the best driver was when I started architecture to look at the aspiring aspects of what is happening in society and try to adapt that into the type of architecture that we were dealing with. So my, my foremost way of looking at this is if you're becoming an architect, never think about architecture for the sake of architecture. Think about architecture as something in the service of the people and the environment. Um, I, uh, one thing I would like, I mean, there are so many things that I would like to share, but one thing that I would uh, maybe focus on uh, is as an architect, um, do not be shy of being, of playing the role of sort of the educator for your client uh, in any project that you will be working on. And do not underestimate the small projects, even the smallest one, because they truly have an impact. I would advise that uh, each one uh, to, to help their clients see the value of their projects not in terms of uh, an individual uh, use only, uh, whether be it a house or an apartment, but also to see the bigger picture of what would this project do to the surrounding neighborhood, how it would be uh, a community, uh, um, I would say, a community uh, benefiting uh, element, whether it's be it in the environment or the climate, or even as uh, as a beautiful eyesight for the, uh, the for the neighborhood. Uh, so help your clients to think uh, the on on the greater value of this product at the end of the day. I want to thank our guests Chatel Torson of Snow Hetel and Fatma Rashid of Ithra for joining me for this session of Ithra Talk series. A version of this talk will be available on ITRA's website and YouTube channel. I'd also like to remind our audiences that ITRA has reopened our doors last week, and we have building tours to experience this masterpiece of a building. And coming this fall, we'll have engineering tours to show you the back of house. So please come and visit us soon. I'm Rasha Rawaf of ITRA, and I want to thank you all for joining us. We'll be back again later this year with a new series of ITRA Talks. And in the meantime, stay tuned for other upcoming and exciting new programs and offerings from ITRA. Thank you. Thank you.